Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this complete CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn about why we have Ether Channel. And we'll start off by having a very quick review of the campus design model again. So our end hosts, like our PCs, get plugged into our access layer switches. Our access layer switches uplink to the distribution layer switches, and then they uplink to the core layer switches. End hosts do not constantly send traffic onto the network. Most of the time, their network connection is sitting idle. If you think about what you're doing when you're sitting on a PC, if you're working on a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet or something like that, there's no traffic actually going over the network. Because of this, you can connect less uplinks to each higher layer than the number of hosts you have and still maintain acceptable network performance because you don't need to support all of the possible bandwidth that your hosts have because they're not all going to be using it at the same time. But if I go back a slide, you see here we've got our two buildings. We've got four access layer switches in each building for the example. And let's say that they are 48 port switches. And I've got 40 end hosts plugged into each switch. So that would be four times 40, 160 hosts in the main building, 160 hosts in building one as well. They're uplinking to a pair of distribution switches in both buildings. So I've got 160 devices in both buildings, but I don't have 160 uplinks going from the access layer to the distribution layer. Also, I don't have that amount of uplinks going from the distribution layer up to the core layer. I don't need to put that many in because I know that my PCs are not gonna be transmitting at the same time. They don't actually need that much bandwidth. A starting rule of thumb recommendation for how much oversubscription you should have in your campus LAN is 20 to 1 from the access layer to the distribution layer. Meaning, if you had 20 PCs connected with 1 gigabit per second network cards at the access layer, you would require a single 1 gig uplink to the distribution layer to support their traffic. The recommendation is four to one for the distribution to core layer links. And bear in mind that those are general values. You should analyze the traffic on your network to verify that your links are not congested because it depends on the particular traffic patterns in your network, what applications you're running, etc. what will be a good oversubscription ratio for you. But these are good ballpark figures. Switches often have dedicated uplink ports which have got higher bandwidth than the bandwidth on their access ports. For example, a 48 port 1 gigabit switch with a pair of 10 gig uplinks and that can help with the subscription ratio. For example, if you've got 48 1 gig clients plugged into that switch, then the total bandwidth there possible would be 48 gigabits per second. You've got your two 10 gig uplinks, so that's 20 gig on your uplink links. So that gives a subscription ratio of 2.4 to 1. If we didn't have those 10 gig uplinks, if the uplinks were also one gig as well, the subscription ratio would be 24 to one. Obviously not as good. So normally when you do have switches which have got higher bandwidth uplinks, then oversubscription is not going to be a problem. However, we do have a problem when we want to connect to uplinks. And that problem is spanning fee because spanning tree it provides redundancy but it does not provide load balancing spanning tree always selects the one best path to avoid loops so if a switch has got multiple equal cost paths 
via the same neighbor switch towards the root bridge, it will select one of those ports, the one which has got the lowest port ID. It's not going to load balance across all of them. So in our example here with the diagram, we've got uplinks from our access layer, access one switch, going to the distribution one switch. And we've got two 10 gigabit ethernet interfaces, zero slash one and zero slash two. Zero slash one will be selected as the root port as it has got the lowest port ID and T0 slash 2 is blocking. So even though we physically connected two 10 gigabit ethernet uplinks, we only get 10 gigs worth of uplink bandwidth, not the 20 gig, because spanning tree is going to block one of those links. So that's the problem. We don't get all of our available physically connected uplink bandwidth. The solution is ether channel. Ether channel groups multiple physical interfaces into a single logical interface. And spanning tree then sees that ether channel as a single interface, so it doesn't block any parts. We now get the full 20 gigs worth of bandwidth. So if you look back on the previous slide when we weren't using ether channel, spanning tree sees that as a possible loop because traffic could go up t0 slash 1 and then back down t0 slash 2 and then back up t0 slash 1 again so we've got a potential loop there when we don't have ether channel but when we do configure ether channel for spanning tree it counts as a single link as a single interface on both sides so spanning tree does not see it as a potential loop and now we get the full 20 gigs worth of bandwidth Traffic will be load balanced across all the links that are in the ether channel. So traffic from my PC is going upstream is going to be load balanced across all the links. The same for the traffic coming back down in the other direction. It doesn't just provide load balancing, it provides redundancy as well. If an interface goes down, its traffic will fail over to the remaining links. So that was ether channel on our switches. We can do basically the same thing on our servers as well with NIC teaming. So going back a slide, ether channel is where we can bundle multiple physical parts into a single logical part on our inter switch links. On our servers with NIC teaming, we can bundle multiple physical network cards into a single logical interface. Benefit we get from this is we get the load balancing and the redundancy again. And because the operating system sees it as a single interface, we just have one IP address on there, which makes things much more convenient and simple to configure. I'm putting this information in here as well because I wanted to explain the terminology to you and let you know that there's several different names for what's basically the same thing. Ether channel on our switches is also known as a port channel. In fact, when you hear me talking about it during this section, you'll probably hear me call it a port channel more than ether channel. People in the industry, we tend to call it that more often. It can also be known as a lag, which stands for a link aggregation or a link bundle. When we bundle our physical interfaces on our servers, we'll usually call it NIC teaming. It can also be called bonding, NIC balancing, and again, link aggregation. Okay, so that was why we have Ether Channel. It gets us past that problem with spanning tree and also a quick overview of the terminology as well. See you in the next lecture. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad free right now, then you can enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp by clicking the link above my head or in the description. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.